What do you get when you combine a world-class Olympic gymnast in his prime? Good morning, Jonathan. You're looking handsome as always. An ancient, deadly competition. Oh. Ah! Cold War era geopolitical tensions. Who's this? I don't know. His name's Amir. He intends to overthrow the Khan and sell the country to the other side. A village populated entirely by the mentally ill. <laughs> Criminal overuse of the same sound effects. <laughs> A hero who looks constantly lost and confused. And many, many, many shots of people running through the woods. You get 1985's Jim Cotta, starring actual real-life Olympic gymnast Kurt Thomas. This is a new series I want to start called Bad Movie Breakdown. Enough of me blabbing, let's get into it. This movie begins with one of the most visually captivating title sequences ever put to film. Okay, I'm just going to skip ahead a bit. Oh, look, something's going on. Oh, we finally get some gymnastics. All right, that's cool. He's doing a twirl around the bar. Oh! That was alarming. wonder what that was. That has to be the last time. Glad that's over. Next, we're treated to a five-minute chase scene of this guy running through the woods in vibrant green sweatpants. He gets shot with an arrow. And then, some more gymnastics. Four minutes into this movie and we've already got a freeze frame. Beautiful. This mysterious guy from the crowd stops this uh, fangirl from approaching our hero because, you know, you, get, you must be pure in mind and body and spirit if you're going to embark on an epic journey like this. All right, before we go any further, one thing that's completely missing from this movie is the introduction of that guy in the suit there. So he's some kind of CIA special operatives recruiter for the U.S. government. None of that is explained, by the way. There's no scene where he says, hi, I'm from the CIA. We need you to do this mission. I don't even know that guy's name. I don't think he has a name in this movie. Next, we get our big exposition scene. You recognize him? Khan of Parmistan. What do you know about his country? It's a tiny mountain nation in the middle of the Hindu Kush range. Why is the U.S. so interested in the small mountainous nation? A Star Wars satellite station inside Parmistan could monitor all the other satellites around the world. It would be the ultimate early warning system in case of nuclear attack. Who's this? I don't know. His name's Amir. He intends to overthrow the Khan and sell the country to the other side. So we got a bad guy who intends to overthrow the leader of that nation and sell the country out to the other side. Then why would they recruit an Olympic gymnast with no combat training? Why doesn't the U.S. just send in some special forces, some Sam Fisher Splinter Cell type guys? Why don't we send in the troops? Direct military action is out of style, my friend. Oh. Anyone who enters Pakistan must play the game. I feel like they could have came up with a better name than The Game. No outsider has won the game in over 900 years. If he wins, he's allowed his life and one request. Other countries are training their athletes right now. A lot of people want that one request. The U.S. wants to use that one request for winning the game to build their satellite station. The Khan is being challenged inside his country by a radical group. They'd like to open the borders and sell the satellite station to the other side. Wait, they'd like to open the borders and sell the satellite station to the other side. So there's already a satellite station in the country? Why would they have a satellite station? Parmistan is like in the medieval era. They don't even seem to have electricity. What does Parmistan use its satellite station for? And how would they even get a satellite station built? Zamir intends to sell out a pre-existing satellite system. I think. Any questions? None. At the beginning of this movie, the guy in the bright green sweatpants was our hero's father, who previously participated in the game, but 
uh, has never been seen again, assuming he died. But where his father failed, he will succeed because for whatever reason, they have the help of the princess of Parmistan, who is an expert in the game. He says the princess will be handling his training from now on. And her version of training him mostly consists of beating him up and surprising him with knives. Like any good 80s action movie, we get a training montage. Now in this training montage, I want to point out that he has two main teachers. You've got this one big American dude in the gray sweatpants who's teaching him fighting techniques, which makes sense because he's a gymnast, he doesn't know anything about combat. And then you have this other teacher, this martial arts guru guy. He does have a lot of wisdom to impart on our hero. Do not hear the wood split. Hear the only sound of axe cut in the air. Read the air. Itself. It has much to say to you. We're also treated to this beautiful little moment during the training montage. Let's just say the sound effects guy had a blast this day. How is that supposed to help him? Once our hero is able to handstand up a flight of stairs, our guru trainer gives us a very warm and congratulatory, uh, well, you'll see. Come on, come on, almost, come on! Come on, you get on, yes, ah, yeah! I also love how that's edited, how abrupt that is. Come on, you get on, yes, ah, yeah! Now we finally get some character relationship building development between our hero and the princess. Our hero flirts with the princess in the only way he knows possible, by doing backflips. Good morning, Jonathan. You're looking handsome as always. Did you sleep well? Like a log. I guess those backflips were too much for her to take because then they smooch. Sometimes you just gotta take a chance. And we get a little shot that reminds me of the, uh, the Alfred Hitchcock train through the tunnel thing. Yeah, that's right. Now we got our last briefing for the hero before he goes out on his mission. You will be flown to your rendezvous and taken by boat to the border town of Carabal on the Caspian Sea. Carabal on the Caspian Sea. Did you get that? Well, if not, they'll remind you. Jonathan, what town are you going to? Carabal on the Caspian Sea. Carabal on the Caspian Sea. Did you get that? Well, don't worry, they'll remind you again. So they arrive in Carabao and they're greeted by this guy in the beige suit. We're treated to a little bit of what I guess is an attempt at clever writing. It's a nice boat. I suppose one of many. Well, boats and buses. Compliments to the American taxpayer. It figures. Now we get a scene uh, reminiscent of any James Bond movie where Q is showing James Bond the various gadgets he'll use. Except these interesting gadgets mostly consist of sharp knives. Looks ordinary enough, huh? Very impressive. Don't! Press that, and it'll kill a man at 20 feet. Fine piece of work. Then comes one of my favorite lines in the whole movie. The only way we can get you into Parmistan is by pack mule. And then not all the way. What kind of place is this that the only way you can get in is by pack mule? And then even the pack mule doesn't get you there. So as our hero and the princess are taking way too long to shop through this marketplace, we're treated to another little bit of really um, intelligent and biting satirical writing. You are making... Yeah. Alright, then we get one of my favorite little moments from the entire movie. 
there's just a little anti-American sentiment running around. But I think... <laughs> but I think... <laughs> One more. <laughs> there's just a little anti-American sentiment running around. But I think... <laughs> God, I love how abrupt that is. So he must give chase. Now we're treated to our first moment of a random act of gymnastics. Why else hire him for this movie if you're not gonna have him do like 50 scenes of backflips and jump kicks and stuff? It is impressive watching Kurt Thomas do his gymnastics slash karate routines, but there's also a amount of uh, terrible other stuff, like this fake blood, for example. Look at that, it looks like they just smeared some ketchup packets on this guy. So our hero goes back to the little hideout and the beige suit guy tells our hero that they've kidnapped the princess. Zamira knows every move we're making. Hundreds of miles away and he still reaches us. Not for long, because I'll kill him. Where's Rubali? Where is she? Where is that? I'm getting her out. A little chase scene happens. Our hero runs down an alley. Conveniently, he finds a nice metal pole secured between the walls of buildings in an alleyway and, uh, you know, just starts flipping. Because, I mean, what else would you do if you're an Olympic gymnast? So he's flipping, the guys come, he kicks one. He kicks the other. He kicks two more. And then he kicks some random guy on a bicycle. And you'll be fine. So then he enters the building where our princess is being held, and this big henchman goon guy comes down the stairs. Retreated to this really weird edit, so he sees the bad guy, runs out of the door, and then he's still in the room. I don't know what's going on. Anyway, he fights him, he beats him up. Shoots that guy. Rescues the princess. Then we're treated to a 12 and a half minute, really boring chase scene. This chase scene could have been condensed down to 30 seconds. I'll do that for you. So our hero and the princess go back to the hideout, and then the guy in the beige suit turns out... Oh, sh... He's betrayed him! Oh, no! And then, suddenly... I always said that special intelligence should have handled this whole operation. Wait, I, I, I thought you said that you didn't... Direct military action is out of style, my friend. I always said that special intelligence should have handled this whole operation. I don't know. Whatever. Our hero and the princess are back together. Now they must continue into the isolated nation of Parmistan. And we're given another scene that's way too long of people walking through the woods. Here, when the princess encounters some ninja dudes and he fights them, does some more impressive little karate gymnastics moves. And then one of these guys hits him on the head. And then he wakes up in Parmistan. So is this what that guy in the beige suit meant? That this is the only way to get into Parmistan? That you can go only so far by pack mule, then you had to take a raft, then you have to walk through the woods, then a group of ninjas has to attack you and hit you on the head, then you'll wake up in the country, then you have to fight for your life in the death competition. Sounds like a nice place. Anyway, our hero wakes up to be greeted by a beautiful maiden. Where am I? Where's the Princess Rabali? What's going on? You'll get no answer. 
He has no tongue. And is given a warm welcome by the bad guy who intends to overthrow the government. Who are you? Commander Zamir, advisor to the Khan. If there is anything I can do for you, please ask. And as I said, welcome. Thanks. No. Okay, okay. Next, our hero meets up with uh, some of the other competitors who are going to participate in the game. Probably my favorite character in this whole movie is the King of Parmesan, or the Khan, whatever they call him. Uh, he shows the competitors the outline of the, the game map on this crappy little diorama they made, I guess from parts from like Michael's craft store or something. Then we get this beautiful line delivery by the king. If you'll excuse me now, gentlemen... I must go play king for my people. Yes, I am the king. <laughs> Next is possibly my favorite little takeaway from this movie. Yakmala! 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 Or get some beautiful shots of the locals. They have some guys that were convicted of terrible crimes in the country, so they're going to give them a chance of freedom by letting them participate in the game. Look at this shot here. This this was totally on accident left in the movie. Notice this guy here. This horse just runs him over. Man, that must have hurt. Holy crap, let's see that again. So then we're treated to another 10 minute sequence of people running through the woods. After all the prisoners have been murdered, well, it's time for a celebration. Evening time in Parmesan, we see a wonderful little festival going on. And I am not really sure when or where this country is supposed to be. Because they have court jester looking people here, oriental looking umbrella, they have this gypsy looking dude putting pins through his mouth. My favorite character, the king, comes out. Oh yeah, they love the king. Who doesn't love this guy? You know what? I think it's time for another Yakamala. Yakamala! Now we learn a little bit of backstory about our hero and his father, who previously played the game. My father, Colonel Cabot, he came here to play the game. What happened to him? Your father was a superb competitor, but he was not victorious. Let us all wish his son good fortune. So yeah, your father uh, died playing this game, but uh, good luck. This other big dude who's like the big heavy bad guy of this movie walks in. Our hero seems to know him. He's like, hey, I was a fan of you. And he just gives him the cold shoulder. Thor, Jonathan Cabot, I've admired you since Munich. All of these actors are, are so adept at their craft that they can convey such deep emotions without even saying anything. Then later that night, our hero wants to have a secret rendezvous with the princess for some little smoochy smoochy. I'm not sure what his plan is here, so he surprises that old hag lady. You will take me to the princess for Bali. She shows him where the princess's room is, then he gives her the knife and says go away. I, I, I don't know. So we're given even more depth and deep lore about this country of Parmistan. He has already earned a lot of enemy for letting the twenties go unpunished. The twenties? The young people. They want our country to join the 20th century. Why? Sound interesting? Well, don't worry, it never comes up again. That sounds intelligent. I mean, these people don't even seem to have electricity. This is 1985. Like, y you could expand and uh, open up a little bit. We get some really uh, 
intense acting from the two of them. It's not gonna happen. Don't play tomorrow. I have to. You'll get killed. Wouldn't I be killed anyway? Do you think they're just gonna allow me to walk out of here? I'll win. You cannot defeat him now. I will defeat him. And then uh, some bad guys show up and the princess runs away like one of those inflatable floppy arm ah! things from a used car lot. Finally, it's time for our hero to participate in the game. And mind you, we're like 50 minutes into the movie. You know what? I think it's time for another Yakmala. Yakmala! Yakmala! Then we're treated to another 10 minute sequence of people running through the woods. So the competitors reach this big cliff with the ropes. As our hero is going up, he decides to burn the rope. But only when he's like 90% up the way. I wonder, why didn't they just shoot the hero with the bow and arrows too? Why did they have to burn the rope? That's the evil movie villain logic. You could easily kill him, but no, we're just gonna do this elaborate method. It probably won't work. It's time for more running through the woods. Our hero has his encounter with the big heavy of the movie. This is going to be a big fight. Get ready for the intensity in his acting. The finish line for you is right here, Cabot. Out of the way, Thorg. And now, finally, as the danger builds and the army with the bow and arrow show up, we're reminded of the words of wisdom from the training guru earlier in the movie. Hear the only sound of axe out in the air. See, that's some intelligent writing right there. It bookends it, it creates a theme, things connect. And we're treated to this weird edit here. Okay, I see what happened here. I'm gonna break this down for you. So they had one take without the arrows. There's a shot of the two trees, hero goes behind the tree, from one frame to the next, they cut. It's a new take. Then it looks like they left the arrows in the tree, had some intern on the set, slap the arrows so they wiggle, looking like they were actually just shot. Then our hero pops back out. He's free to run away and advance to the next stage of the competition, the village of the insane. Our hero enters the mysterious, creepy village. Beautiful acting abilities and expressions on Kurt Thomas's face. Constantly confused and bemused and unaware and looking like he's never seen buildings before. Yes, it's an empty street. There's a goat. Okay. Let's move on. All right, now. As our hero makes his way through this creepy village, we're treated to a delightful little smorgasbord of psychotic people. Some of my favorites include people like this. <laughs> Listen to the way this random guy grunts as he's trying to fight the hero. Really reminds me of something. As our hero's walking through the village, he gets uh, surrounded by a group of little old babushka ladies. Kurt Thomas has no problem beating up babushkas. And then comes what I believe is supposed to be the climax, the peak, the pinnacle of the action in this movie. As our hero is running through the village of the mentally insane, he encounters a pommel horse. One of those things that gymnasts do their flips and twirls on. Because why not, you know? I mean, why wouldn't that be in the village of the insane? Kurt Thomas does what he does best. He mounts the pommel horse and proceeds to kick the crap out of mentally ill people.
As our hero approaches the end of the village of the insane, we're treated to a really intense moment. So intense that it must be shown in slow motion. Wow, Ooh, this is, this has got me on the edge of my seat. Still going with this. How long is this gonna go on for? Turns out our hero has been rescued by his thought to be long lost father. Dad. Father? I knew you'd get here, Jonathan. Don't ever give up, my son. Meanwhile, the princess and her father are being held captive by Zamir's men. The king refuses to acknowledge the fact that Zamir's men are, in fact, bad guys. You're a prisoner in your own palace. Not true. Why are you saying such things? The princess seems to win him over to her side once she brings up the fact that they wear ninja masks. Father, look at them. Face is hidden from you. Well, that... We're almost near the end of this movie, and our hero still has to have his final conflict with the big bad guy, Zamir. But before that, you know, I think we need one more uh, ten minute scene of people running through the woods. Our hero fights the big bad guy in the woods, uh, defeats him with a choking leg headlock thing. Meanwhile, the princess and the king finally decide to fight their way out and beat up Zamir's men. Beautiful little moments like this. Get out of my way. Traitor! Whoever's playing this king guy seems to be having the most fun on this entire set. Princess and the king run outside, convince the rest of the population of Parmistan that the evil guys wearing black holding them all captive are in fact bad guys. They say, look, someone's coming down the alley. It's our hero and his father. So I guess they're gonna get that one wish, right? And they're gonna build the satellite station. Well, we never see that one wish. We get our second and final freeze frame of the movie. Look down here, it's uh, they put an extra space here. No one proofread that or looked at it before it went out. Ah, you know what we need? One more scene of gymnastics. Well, there you have it. That was my bad movie breakdown of Jim Kata, starring Kurt Thomas. If you've watched this far, thank you for watching. I appreciate it. Until next time, I have but one thing to leave you with. Yakmala. Yakmala.